Well, today, today I'm excited that we're, we're in our last week of Excited About Faith. We're ex- in our last week of Excited About Faith. Next week, we're going to be back in Acts, and we're going to be having a special Sunday with Acts, which is going to be super fun, so you're going to want to come check that out. But today, today we're in our very last week of Excited About Faith. And, and, and last week, we, we talked about what it means to be excited and to have heart, to have heart where, where Jesus is coming in and he, he's, he's helping us with the scars, with the things that are in our heart when we're spending time with him and we're praying with him. But today we're going to talk about the other two things that we need to be totally excited about faith and continually excited about faith and find joy in faith and, and joy in God in all times because that's what we really want. That's what we really need. We all need to be excited about faith, to be, uh, to, to be just overjoyed and overcome by faith. Think back to it when, when you first got to know who Jesus was. When you first got into involved in, in church and you first got into this, like when it actually meant something to you, not when you were forced to come as a kid, not when you were forced to come, as some of you are the husbands that are forced to come because your wives are making you, or, or the opposite is true, right, where, where husbands are forcing the wives. That doesn't breed excitement, does it? No, but, but remember that point, that time in your life where, where you were the most excited about Jesus, where you're the most excited about God, where you're like, yes, God, you are incredible. Remember that faith, that, that overjoyment, that, that time when, when you felt like you could do anything with God because God was with you. How do we get that back? And so this week, we're going to be talking about the last two things that we need to just continually have, to continually pour into us, to continually use for us to become excited about faith once again, to be overjoyed by faith, to have a faith that is sustainable, a faith that weathers the storms, a faith that makes us excited. One of those faiths that makes you just wake up in the morning and go, yeah, Jesus, come on, let's go. We want that kind of faith. So let's talk about how we get there with these last two things. First, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you so much for this time. We pray, Jesus, that you would just continue to be in our hearts and our minds. Bless us, Lord, with your word. We pray, Jesus, that you would bless it to our heart and that, uh, that you would just show us your will today. We love you. We thank you. Amen. Amen. Well, today we're talking about the last two things on Excited About Faith. Last week, just kind of reiterate, we talked a lot about heart. We talked a lot about heart, how we have to have a heart of Jesus, that we have to be those people that, that internalize God. It's, it's not just a, a, about knowing, it's, it's about having him in our heart and letting him do that hard heart work within us. But today we're going to start off with the second thing you need. The second thing you need, and most of you already know it, most of you have heard it before. In fact, you're here on Sundays, and many of you are here every single Sunday, and so you know this. You, you know this thing, and this thing is so important to us. It's so important to our growth. The second thing that we need, we need wisdom, head, knowledge. Got to actually know who God is. And, and, and I will tell you that it's actually kind of a misnomer. When I say it's the second thing, it's not really the second thing. It's not really the second thing. A lot of times we have an idea where we start numbering things, right? When we say, okay, like heart number one, head number two, and, and so forth, and we start putting them in order of priority. This isn't a, one of those things where we're putting them in order of priority. Sometimes in your life, actually knowledge, head knowledge, wisdom, that's going to have to be number one, heart number two. Other times in your life, you're going to go through times where you have so much knowledge already, where you've got that knowledge and you've got the head knowledge that's there, but now you need more heart. And so now heart is going to be number one. And most times in your life, you're going to have to actually make head and heart equal to each other because you need those two things in your life. You need those two things in your life in order for those things to fill up your life in order for you to actually to, to be excited about Jesus, to be excited about God and continually excited about him, to be that person that, that is like that Colossians 3.16 person. That Colossians 3.16, it says this. It says, let the message about Christ in all of its richness fill your lives. Fill your lives. Let the message of Christ in all of its richness fill your lives. Your lives. Now, I'm going to tell you guys that, that actually that word there, fill, it doesn't do a very good job in translation. There, there is a lot, of, a lot that's lost in translation when we look at this verse. Because if you didn't know this, if this is your first time hearing this, the Bible wasn't written in English. The Bible was written in Greek. 
And in ancient Greek, and in ancient Greek, you have these words and you have certain words that mean so much and they have just such great meanings and such an expanse and expanse. And when we try to translate it into English, sometimes we don't do a great job because we're trying to find a word that matches another word. And sometimes we just can't find one. So we have to go close to it. And this is one of those verses where we have to get close to it because that word fill is actually a Greek word, a Greek word that's, that's, that's coming from the original transcripts called called Inokyo. Inokyo. Can you guys say that with me? Inokyo. Sounds like Pinocchio, except your nose isn't going to grow. It's Inokyo. Uh, it's Inokyo. And, it, and it's this great word. It means this fullness. It means fullness. It means indwelt spirit. It means like a, a, a fullness of spirit throughout everything, every part of your being. It's actually, it's actually the action word. It's an action word to another word, which, it, which dates way, way back, called oikos. Oikos, some of you guys may have heard that before. You guys ever been to the grocery store in the yogurt aisle? <laughs> Oikos, yogurt. That actually comes from a, a, a different Greek path. It's a different ancient word. And that oikos actually means it's, it's like a fullness of house. And it's hard to describe in English. But what it basically means is this. It's, it, it's as if you, you have a, it's, it's as if it's the difference between a house and a home. It's basically what it is. It's the difference between a house and a home. See, a house is just wood. It's just a roof. It's got nails. It's got screws. It's, it, it's got rooms that are in there. But, but if nothing is in those rooms, does it do you any good? But the difference between a house and a home is the people that come into it. The things that are in it that fill up every room, the things that are in, that, in those rooms that bring joy and bring laughter and bring love. Oikos is, is this big love verse where it's like, man, this is the thing that fills us up, that fills up every single room. And, and that's the root word that we're going for here. And so when we're actually looking at this, Colossians 3.16, it says, let the message about Christ and all of its richness fill Every part of you, like it's a house, like you're a house and every room in your house is filled with Jesus. That every part of you is filled and overflowing with Jesus, with God. That every part of your being, your head, your heart, your soul, everything is just screaming out, Jesus, Jesus is here. That's what this verse means. To let every part of you scream out, that he is there within you, that he's filling up every part of you, every room inside your temple. And it says, when you do that, you can teach and counsel you. Let it teach and counsel you and each other with the wisdom that he, meaning God, meaning Jesus, gives. Sing songs and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. When it's talking about singing songs and, and, and spiritual hymns and, and, and everything, and it's not just saying go back to the Psalms and start reading through those, come up with your own melodies and make things, right? It's not just saying that. What, what it is is it's like, man, when every part of you is filled with God, when you've got God in every room in your house, when there's just so much joy and so much, so much incredibleness of, of God throughout your whole being, it makes you want to sing out in song. It makes you want to worship in everything that you do. And that's what it's talking about here, that when you're filled so deeply with Jesus, with God, you want to sing out to him, that every part of you is screaming out, Jesus, Jesus, in everything that you do. That's the big filling. But in order to do that, we can't just rely on just the heart. We also need to have the head knowledge You have to have the head knowledge that's in there. It tells us this in 2 Timothy 2.15. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Well, you can't correctly handle the word of truth and know the word of truth and know who God is and know all about God unless you actually go to the source, can you? We have this incredible source, this incredible source document, the Bible, And unless we're going to it, unless we're actually reading in it and getting to know it, we can't know the word of truth. And we can't fill up every room in our house with God unless we know him. That's why this second thing that isn't really a second thing, it's an equal thing, is knowledge. It's wisdom. We need to have it. And when we have it, and we have it from God, we have so much joy and excitement in him. It allows us to fill up that room. 
I'll tell you this, I, I, I see a lot of people that start off just with heart knowledge. That they, they start off because they go, okay, I love Jesus. I love Jesus. He's in my heart. And, and, and I, I know John 3.16, and I know maybe one or two other verses. But then I know Jesus. I know who Jesus is. And a lot of times in our hearts, we might know him, but we start also filling in the blanks that we don't know. Well, what happens when you don't actually go to the source, when you don't actually know all about Jesus through the gospel, through the Bible? Well, number one, we can lose our way because we start realizing in our heart that all of a sudden reality isn't matching up with our thoughts and our imagination. And we have a tendency as people to think that we're right. So we must be right. God must be wrong. I also see a lot of people that start off with heart and it's just heart and all they have in their life is heart and that's great. Heart is a part of it and, and praying and getting to know God, that's a part of it, that's good. But here's the thing is when you're all heart and you're no head, you have no knowledge in, in this, you have no wisdom in this, you don't know the gospels, you don't know anything that comes from scripture or any of that, then we tend to all of a sudden when we get confronted with scripture, when people get confronted with scripture and they go to the Bible and they start looking through it, they start looking through it and they go, well, this isn't the Jesus that I know. And so then they dismiss the word or they dismiss faith. We need to have knowledge of who Jesus is. Know what we're getting into. You know, the same and the opposite can actually be true too. If all we have is head knowledge, is wisdom, but no heart, then all of a sudden we start looking at the world a lot different. We start becoming the Sadducees and the Pharisees. We start becoming those that are ultra-religious, that are saying you have to live by everything, every word that's here. You have to, to live by this. There, there's no other exceptions. And then you start looking at the world and going, everybody is condemned. And that's when you end up on the sides of the road saying, you're all going to hell. Because we have all this head knowledge, but not heart. There has to be a mix of head and heart. And that's what allows us to fill up the room. And I, I have a little bit of a demonstration. I'm going to show you guys with a demonstration today because I like doing demonstrations. And I also like doing stuff with water because it's hilarious to watch Joel's face when I spill. So we're going to pretend that this empty vase is you. This is you. And I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. You're saying, I am not an empty vase. Okay. Yes, you are not just an empty vase, all right? But we're going to put this in just demonstration, just demonstration form, okay? Now, here's God, and God, he wants to give us both head and heart together, he, head and heart. And so we have this right here where we've got heart, we've got head, and here's what happens. All of a sudden, we start to pray, and we start to get to know who Jesus is. We start to pray and spend time with him, and now God starts filling us up. But now... All of a sudden, we start reading the Bible, and we start taking some time, and we get to know who Jesus is. We get to know who God is. We start using our heads, start to know and have knowledge, and he starts filling us up even more. Notice we have a lot of room to go. We have a lot of room to grow, so we go back into prayer and to study, and we, we go into prayer groups, and we get into groups together, and then we're saying, okay, now let's go back in, and let's, let's learn more about who God is, and we keep on filling up back and forth by prayer and knowledge. Now what happens all of a sudden if you stop doing that? If you stop going to the Bible, if you stop reading, you stop getting to know God, it comes back, back in and all of a sudden we start feeling a little bit empty again. We go back and go, hey, I think there's something wrong. There's something wrong. I'm feeling a little empty. And then we stop praying. We stop taking time with God. It goes back in and now all of a sudden we get even more empty. But what would happen if we come back to the word? If we come back to the word, we start learning more about God again. All of a sudden, we get filled up, and we start praying to God, and we take time with him. We get filled up even more, and we continue going on and over. And here's the thing. God still has more to give us, doesn't he? He does. So he continues to pour. But what happens? We overflow. We overflow. There's no more room. There's no more capacity well, we overflow for a reason. And that's because God doesn't just want us to keep internalizing our faith. To just have that faith and that head and that heart together and say, this is all for me. No, we overflow so that way we can start pouring in to other people. Where we can start 
pouring in. And the more we pour into other people, the more God continues to pour into us. We need to overflow. That overflow is purposeful so that we can start pouring in to other people. And that's our third thing. The third thing you need to know to have excitement and faith, to continue living this thing out, to have joy in the morning, to so just be like, yes, Jesus, every single day, is we have to live it out. We can't just keep it for ourselves. We have to actually do it. There's an old phrase called deeper is doing. When deeper is doing, it means that, that we actually have to do this thing that Jesus calls us to. It isn't for us just to hide in our hearts and our heads. It's for us to give out, to pour into other people and to serve other people, to love other people the way that Jesus loves us. You know, we see that in a verse. There's a verse, there's actually so many verses throughout the Bible. Throughout the whole Bible, there is so many verses all about this. There's so many verses all about this, but I'm going to pick up just one. And it's actually this verse in Matthew. It's Matthew 25, 34 through 45. And it's these, these series of verses where Jesus is actually talking. He's talking uh, about as being a king and being King Jesus and him coming back. And him coming back and what's going to happen. And he's using a very, very culturally relevant, culturally dated kind of analogy. And in this analogy and in this culturally dated analogy, he says this. He says that he as the king is going to come back and separate the sheep and the goats. That the sheep and the goats are going to be separated. What is he talking about when he talks about this? Now, see, a lot of times we read this verse and we struggle with this verse a little bit. Because, because we don't really deal with a lot of sheep and goats, Right? Our, 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 our area, we don't have a lot of sheep and goats. Unless you live in Belfair and you have a whole lot of weeds, then you love goats. Because goats go eat anything. But we don't deal with a whole lot of sheep and a whole lot of goats. Right? So this kind of doesn't mean a lot to us. And what Jesus is really talking about, if we know the culture, the history, and what they're actually talking about, their impressions of sheep and goats, was this. Sheep back then, they were easier to handle. They're easier to control. They're, they're easier. When you call a sheep and you're the shepherd, when you call a sheep, guess what? The sheep comes. The sheep comes. The tongue's all hanging out, but he runs to you and everything. Super cute. When you call a goat, the goat goes, I'm good. It goes in the opposite way. The sheep and goats are totally different. To us today, I would say a better analogy for us is actually cats and dogs. Because we can relate with that. See, I actually had an experience this last week with cats and dogs. I have a cat and a dog. I let my cat and my dog outside to go out and do their business and play and all that stuff with this warm weather. So I let them outside this week. And I had to have a very stern conversation with my cat. Because over the fence comes a raccoon. Raccoons started coming over to the pets, and I could see this raccoon from afar. He gets up on the fence, and I mean, it looked like a cartoon. The raccoon got up over the fence, saw the pets in the yard, and actually sat up and licked his lips. You're like, oh my goodness, this is not going to be good. I happen to be outside seeing this whole thing, and the raccoon gets down off the fence and starts staring at my pets. So I call the pets in. My dog, Ella, comes right away. My dog comes up, yes, here I am. What do you want? Comes up to me and running, mouth all open, tongue hanging out, overjoyed. Yes, here I am. Whatever you want, let's go. Let's do something. Let's be together. It was great. The cat? No. I call the cat saying, hey, cat. Actually, I started first with his name, and after that didn't work, he went back to, okay, cat, get here. And the cat immediately heard me. I know the cat heard me. The cat's ears perked up, says somebody's talking to me, looks back at me while I'm standing on the deck, then looks forward and starts strutting in the opposite direction, <laughs> right towards the raccoon. So now I'm yelling over to the cat, cat get over here. The cat stops for a second, looks back as if to say, I hear you, and then continues walking away. 
going in the opposite direction. And now I see the raccoon, and the raccoon's ready because the raccoon's sitting there going, awesome, my meal is coming straight to me. So now I'm yelling at the cat. I can't get down off the deck fast enough to go get the cat. I'm saying, cat, get over here. And the cat starts going, going, and the raccoon gets into position, jumps on the cat and ate him. I'm joking. That would be a messed up story in church, though, right? That was just to see if you were paying attention. No, no. There was the raccoon and there was the cat, but here's what happened. All of a sudden, here comes the cat, and the cat goes around a bush, sees the raccoon, and then immediately makes a bout face, comes to me over on the deck, as if he was saying, I heard you all along. I've been following you this whole time. Come, help me get to safety. And now I get the cat into safety, into the house, and what does the cat do? Goes back to ignoring me. It going in the complete opposite direction. And when we're looking at this verse, that's what Jesus is talking about. There's people that will follow like sheep and saying, yes, Jesus, I'm for you. I'm coming to you. And then there's people that are goats saying, I'm going to go in the opposite way. Until they need them and say, oh, I need to go back. Oh, I'm sorry. My bad, Jesus. I've been following you this whole time. And then all of a sudden... All right, I'm safe again. I'm going to go this way. And that's what Jesus is talking about in this with sheep and goats. And he says, then the king will say to those on his right. And what he's saying is the sheep are getting put on his right. The the sheep, the ones who follow. The king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. For I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Notice what he's saying here. He's saying it's not just about, hey, you know me, you have knowledge of me, you have me in your heart. No, he's actually saying you also did something with it, that you're doing something with it. You're clothing people, you're helping people, you're you're doing something with the faith. You're doing what God is calling you to do, Jesus is calling you to do. And then the righteous will answer him, Lord... When did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you as a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes to clothe you? When did did we see you sick or in prison and go visit you? And the king, meaning Jesus, says, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Whatever you do for another, you did for me. Saying, Look, you should see Jesus in everything and in everywhere. That it isn't just enough to be filled up with him, but actually pour that out. Be the hands and feet of Jesus as if you were serving Jesus himself. Seeing him everywhere. St. Patrick actually has a quote. St. Patrick had once said that we need to see the face of Jesus in everyone we meet. See the face of Jesus in everyone you meet as if they were Jesus Because whatever you do for the least of them, you do for Jesus. What does that mean? It means to serve. It means to to give. It means to be the hands and feet of Jesus. But what happens if you're also one of the goats? And here's, here's what Jesus says then. Then he will say to those on his left, the goats, depart from me, you who are cursed of internal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. And they will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger in need of clothes, sick or in prison and did not help you? And he will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for the least of these, you did not do for me. This verse is a challenging one, isn't it? It's a challenging one, but it's not just talking about just the hungry and unclothed, the homeless, the imprisoned. It isn't just talking about, what it's talking about is actually serving, is actually being a part of something, of actually using what God gives us, what God gives us and pouring it out on other people. Saying, I I, I see the face of Jesus in everyone and in everyone around us. 
That I'm going to show mercy and forgiveness. And, and when I see a need, I'm going to fill the need. When I'm, when, when I'm there, I, I want to actually follow Jesus, be the hands and feet of Jesus. That's what he's calling us to do. To be the hands and feet of Jesus. To see him everywhere and in every place that we meet. And that's why our third thing is we can't just have head and heart. We need to also live it out. We need to live it out. We need to use what God gives us and actually continue to push it out into the world. Following Jesus. Praying to him. Being guided by him. But then pouring into others. Pouring into others so that others can know him. It means we have to serve. We have to love. And there's so many ways you could do that. You could do that at your workplace. You could do that with your neighbors. You could do that with the people that you just meet at the grocery store. The people that you meet around you. The people that, that God puts in your influence. You can also do that at church. Serving and being here at church and doing things. In fact, if this is your community and your church community, you should be serving in some way. Using your gifts, using your talents, using stuff that God has given you to do that. It's important to do that. I will, I will tell you this. A lot of people, they see, they see some of the jobs and things, and this is a total tangent, but I'll tell you this. A lot of people see the jobs and things that we do at church, and they're like, oh, well, that's not really making a difference. Going out and greeting, that's not making a difference. Making coffee for someone, that's not making a difference. It is. You don't even know the difference that you're having. In fact, I'm a pastor today. I'm a pastor today because of a greeter at a church. See, we were looking for a church. We were looking for a church and a place. And the one church that we went to where there was somebody who was out there that impressed my wife because he came straight to us and shook her hand and said, welcome. Treated her as if she was Jesus. Shook her hand, smiled, greeted her in such a way that she felt loved and seen. She came home that day. She was like, man, this church is so friendly. She met nobody else at the church except for that one person, the greeter. But she had an impression of that church from that one guy. That one guy I later got to know very well. His name is Will. Will the greeter. Will is the grumpiest man you have ever met in your life. Except for on Sunday when he's greeting. <laughs> he is the grumpiest man. But he, and he actually hated people. He hated people. He does not like people. He hated shaking hands. He was a gruff guy. He's the man's man kind of guy. And he's, he's like, man, I don't want to do this at all. But here was the thing. Because he didn't like people, the church said, you should probably be a greeter so you can start learning to love people. And when he started to learn to love people, he loved people so well, he became in charge of the greeters. And he grew a team of greeters and there were so many people in that greeting team, including my wife and myself at first, that got involved just because somebody shook our hand. It's important. Don't say that a job at the church isn't important, that you're not volunteering and serving and helping people, even making coffee. I will tell you, half of my sermons are boring. We need coffee. It's essential. So we need to have those things. So yes, yes, you can serve in, in tons of different ways at church, but also in your neighborhoods, with your friends, with your family. You can serve with the people that you just meet. You can serve the person who's on the side of the road. You can serve in every little way. In everything that you do, you should be serving and living this thing out, pouring it out for others. But I know there's a lot of people that say, I can't. I can't do that. I'm too busy. Too busy. There's too many things going on in my life. It's too much that's happening. And I get it. It's hard. I, in fact, I meet a lot of people and they say, okay, it's, I, I'm too busy to, to serve or to help out people and to pour this out. In fact, I'm too busy to read the Bible. I'm too busy to pray. I get it. I understand. We have a lot of stuff that happens in our life, right? Imagine this vase empty as your day. This is your day when it starts out. It's empty. has nothing in it. But then you wake up. you got to make breakfast. Got to make breakfast. Everybody's got to eat. Then you all of a sudden, you got to take a little bit of time to, to go out and wake up. Read the news. You know, spend a lot of time. Some of you read the news a little bit. Some of you read the news a lot. Then you also have to help out 
with the family. You got to get a whole bunch of stuff going on with the kids and everything. Get them up and ready and going. I can tell you getting my kids up and going is the rest of this. Then all of a sudden you got to go to work. And work takes time, doesn't it? All of a sudden work's taking up your time. Now, if you have kids that are in school or you've got other things and activities, how many of you guys have had, have had kids in school or have kids in school right now and they're in sports? Okay. Honestly, the sports should be the rest of these. <laughs> those take a long time. Some of those sports are like five days a week, right, and practice and all this stuff. But now you've got more time here. Now you've got to get home and you've got family stuff and family obligations. You've got things you've got to do and making dinner and spending time with the family. And then you're so tired at the end of the day, you're like, okay, I need to chill out. I need to have some time, don't I? And so now I'm going to watch Netflix. I'm going to watch Hulu. I'm going to take a little bit of time. This is the me time. And then all of a sudden you're like, uh-oh, i got to actually serve people. And that goes here. And I got to spend time with Jesus. And so Jesus comes here, but it doesn't quite fit in your day, does it? All of a sudden, Jesus becomes last. It doesn't fit in the day. But what if we're getting our priorities wrong? Jesus actually talks about this in another verse. In Matthew, it says this. In Matthew, and he's, he, he talks about, but seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. What he's talking about, all these things, if we back it up a little bit, he says this. If God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and gone tomorrow, and then is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? You of little faith. So why do you worry saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. What he's saying is, is look, God knows you need, all, you need these things in the day. You have to work. You have to eat. You have to have clothes. God knows that. You have to have those things. Absolutely. You also have obligations. God knows that. Absolutely, I, he knows that you need those things. But why are we worrying every single day, filling up every single day with all of our worries and our cares and all of the things that, that we have and we think we need, like I need downtime, I need to spend five hours on Netflix. Why are we filling up all of our time on things we think that we need? God knows what we need instead of just trusting him and putting him first. Notice, in this day, he doesn't fit. He doesn't fit any place in our lives. But what if, what if we decided to change our priorities? And we decided, let's put the kingdom first. Let's put Jesus in here first. And let's think about people People around us and people first and say, okay, look, it's not about me. Every day that I go to work and everything that I do, it's not about me. It's not about all this time. It's actually about people. It's about serving. It's about loving people. It's about people. And we put that in here first. And then we start filling up our day. Notice what happens. It fit this morning. <laughs> But there we go. Notice what happens. All of a sudden, it fits. When Jesus comes first, he fits. It fits into the day. Jesus has to come first. The kingdom has to be first. We have to be living out and saying, okay, I want to actually live this thing out. I want to do this, but I'm going to make it a priority of my life. Not last, but first. Spending time with God, working on head knowledge, working on heart and saying, God, I want to spend time with you. I'm going to put you first. I'm going to put you first in this because, God, you're worth it. Putting the kingdom first. God knows the things that we need. He knows everything that we need. He's going to be with us. But we got to put the kingdom first. Live this thing out. And what happens when we do that? What happens when we do that? So we start pouring out to other people, saying, I'm going to put other people first. I'm going to continue following God. I'm going to continue putting God first. And now notice all of a sudden we have more room in our cup. We have more room in our cup, and God starts pouring back into us from head 
and heart. And then God starts doing something fancy. God starts saying, you have more capacity. You have more things because you were already at a place where you were 2.0. But now that you have more room in the cup, now it's time to challenge you a little. And he starts saying, how about we get to know a little bit of theology? How about we get to know me a little deeper? How about I challenge you to do a little bit more? And all of a sudden, your cup starts to change, starts to change color. And you go from 2.0 to now 3.0. And God continues to fill you up and allow you to overflow so that way you can keep on pouring into other people. And notice what happens when you're pouring in that good knowledge and that good heart. It starts changing the color of everyone else. Notice what happens when all of a sudden we start pouring this thing in our day. Let's see if we could do this. <laughs> there we go. It starts to come into us. We're going to save Joel here. We're going to put this over here. <laughs> but it starts to come throughout our whole day as well. And our whole day becomes about God. Our whole day starts to get infected. Every part of our day starts to be filled up just like that word, Enochio. All of a sudden, that whole day that we have and that we've been living starts to be filling up for God. That God is all of a sudden changing every part of our day. He's making us realize who he is in every part of our day and every part of our being. is being changed by him. Excited with him. This is how we get that excitement and continue with this excitement is to continue putting him first, to put other people first, to continue going back to the source with head and heart and saying, Jesus, I just want more of you. And I'm going to put you first. So today as we conclude, and as the band comes up, I'll tell you, I'm going to give you guys some challenges today. Some challenges that are a little bit multifaceted. But I want you to look at your daily lives and your excitement level. I want you to look at your daily lives and say, okay, God, where am I putting you? Like, is this your day right now? Is this your day? Where are you putting God? Are you saving him for last? Or are you putting God first? Saying, God, I want you to do everything. God, I want you to be in everything. I want you to be a Nokio. I want you to be throughout every being, every fiber of my being. Where are we putting God right now? And once we have a good answer in our heads, like we actually realize where we're putting God. Like be honest with yourself. Be honest with yourself. There might be things that you're saying, okay, in my day, I'm spending way too much time on Netflix. I'm, I have way too much time on Hulu. Well, could you take some of that time and put God first? Yeah. Or what if we looked at our day and we said, okay, how can I actually wake up in the morning and say, God, I want to work on some head knowledge today. I'm going to read the Bible. Or God, I'm realizing that I understand the Bible, but right now I'm struggling with the heart. So you just spend time in prayer. Be honest with yourself this week and say, where am I putting God? Where is he fitting in my life? And then change it. Improve it. And say, God, I want you to be first. I want to put you first in my life. I want to serve people first in my life. I want to make what you want a priority. All those other things that are worries in our life, they're going to take care of themselves. God's going to take care of them. But how do I make God first? I want you to take time this week and look at that and say, God, I want to put you first. Show me how to do that and reorder your life in a way that God comes first. Because here's what you do. When God comes first in your life, you're going to start being more excited, more excited for that head knowledge and for that heart knowledge. And you're going to be more excited to continue pouring out into other people. You're going to be more excited to people all around you're going to want to keep on pouring out. And God's going to be saying, look, great. You have more room in your cup. I'm going to keep pouring into you. And we reorder our lives and we make him first. It's a continual cycle. Heart, head, and living it out. In order for us to continue being excited about faith, we have to do those three things. So this week, take a look at yourself and say, 
where am I at in these? And then improve it. Say, I'm going to take the challenge. I'm going to look at my head, my heart. I'm going to live this out and put Jesus first. Do this this week.